I'm Jeff. I'm the pastor here. I'm glad to hang out with y'all today and uh, look forward to uh, diving into this message. This is the last installment of the Heaven series, and I've had a good time working on this series. Have you guys had a good time taking it in? Man, I hope it's been helpful to you because uh, we all need a little hope. We all need a little hope infusion that uh, that there's more, that life is bigger than what we see here. Um, and so, um, you know, especially like in a, in a day like today, our friends down in Houston. Houston, we have a problem. A big problem going on in Houston right now, right? I don't know if you've been watching what's happening with that storm coming coming ashore. And it looks like that, that storm's going to camp out there for quite a while, right? And more and more rain, another 20 inches of rain or something crazy coming in there on those people. And it's suffering and misery already, and it's going to get worse. And so uh, so right now, I wanted to take a few minutes and just ask you to pray with me about that, about what's happening there in that region down in Texas and Louisiana. And that storm, um, we may get a little bit of the aftermath of that tomorrow. Um, it'll be just a slight reminder of what they're going through down in that space. But I want you to pray with me about them. But also, before I pray, I want to just talk to you about disaster relief and how to respond. And I know you, you as, as folks Community Church, man, you guys are responders and you love to, to get involved and you love to serve. And so I want to go coach you just a, just a tad about, about this. We'll be watching for ways to effectively respond, but they pro- those ways probably won't happen in the next week or two or three. It may be a month or two down the line because here's what's going on. In a case like this, when it's a disaster like they have, the people they need there are the ones who know what they're doing. They really don't need you or me there in the middle of it clogging up the works unless you're an expert at swift water rescue or something like that. Otherwise, you probably need to back away, let the people who know what they're doing do their thing. And then, then our government actually has some pretty good systems to respond, and they seem like they're getting that in place. Let them handle. And then the next one would be the Red Cross. So if you really want to send money right now, the place that would send money is to the Red Cross because they know how to get it to the people that need it. It's not going to be squirreled away in some weird thing. There'll be a lot of entities pop up right now that want to go do disaster relief who may or may not know what they're doing. I've just seen this happen a lot. So let me just encourage you to be reasoned and wise with your response. And we will be, we'll do the same as a church and figure out how we're going to help, or where we're going to help in a way that's strategic and effective for the long game, not just a knee-jerk reaction. Make sense? So uh, pray with me for these people. God, help us to... Uh, to know how to respond and how to help. But I'm praying right now, God, for specific intervention. Right now, there's a family who's in an attic, and they're trying to figure out how to get out. I'm praying for rescue. There's a grandmother with a couple of little children. The water's rising in that home, and they don't know where they're going to go or what they're going to do. God, would you send rescue boats right now? God, there are people that are struggling with what their decision should be to stay or to go. Give them wisdom. Be with the rescuers there that are working so hard and tirelessly with thousands of rescues going on even right now. Be with the local government and the state government, federal government, as they figure out what resources to send and how to deploy the right people. And I pray now, God, that you give them wisdom and insight, that you would allow our response as a country to be strong and swift and sure, that you would allow churches like ours to figure out how to partner and how to help in ways that are strategic and that bring advantage and not disadvantage that help and not hurt. And then God help us to be wise about, uh, about what financial resources we might send. So God, teach us, coach us in how to be good neighbors to those who are hurting so desperately. But God, we're asking most of all that you be sovereign, be God in that space in a way that would bring glory to you and rescue to them in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So you know that in life we all face little hurricanes, Right. Maybe nothing like what they're having down in Texas, but we all face our own personal hurricanes, right? We all have moments when you see the storm coming, and it's coming offshore, and it comes in the form of a diagnosis. It comes in the form of a financial crisis. It comes in the form of a job loss, a business partnership dissolving. There's all kinds of things. And if I, went, if I talked to each one of you, went through the room right now, each one of you are probably either coming out of a storm or heading into a storm. You've probably, or you have one on the radar. It's starting to blip up out there. And your little personal national weather service in your brain is starting to ping a little bit. It's starting to tell you, hey, this storm's coming. Something's, something's coming. Something's brewing. And you start to get a little nervous about what's happening in life. Well, as a church, as your pastor, and as our staff, as we work together, we, we want to build systems for you to handle the storms of life. We want to help you. 
And uh, one way to do that is through, through sermons like this. And, and we're sitting in rows and we're taking in things. And we're learning about God and we're worshiping him together. This is really good. And rows are a good place to be. Well, when storms hit, you need to be in circles. And what I mean is you need, you need the strength of a small group. You need the strength of some people who know you, who will shoulder to shoulder take on the storm with you, who will come help you move stuff to higher ground or help get you out of your situation. And that's really where small groups come in. And we really want you not just to be in rows like this, We'd like for you to be in circles, too. We'd like for you to gather with some other people who will get to know you and love you and care for you. Now, this is Meredith Lewis, and she's been an excellent example of, of one who's, who's taking advantage of small group in a very powerful way because she invested in small group. But she's our staff leader for small group ministry and for the spiritual life development in this church. She's doing a great job, and so I'll let her tell you whatever she wants to about that. But, but thanks for what you do, and this is exciting, the gift we want to give to people, getting into circles, getting into small groups. Um, like Jeff said, I'm Meredith, and I wear several hats here at Foes, but perhaps my favorite is small groups coordinator because I get to see what small groups can do in your lives and in my life. Um, some of you may or may not know me. My husband passed away two months ago to cancer, seven-month battle with cancer, and I have been surrounded by all of you, and especially the small groups, um, the people that have loved me the most are people from my small groups, and it has been amazing to watch, and not just the ones I'm in now, but the ones that I was in, you know, two years ago or whatever. Like, it's just been amazing, and I don't know what I would do without them. Um, one in particular story um, comes from one, uh, a particular man who's been helping, or like, has done so much over the course of the last year. We've been dealing with this, but this week, um, he had helped put landscaping in, as some of you did at my house earlier this summer, and this week... He was, um, we were talking on the phone, and I was like, you know what? Some of my plants just aren't growing, and I don't know if it's something in the soil. What's going on? And he goes, you know what? Well, next year, we'll put something in the soil to help them grow better. And I just started crying because he was in it for next year and next year and the next year. He's in it for the long haul. His family's in it to help me for the long haul. And if I, not connected them within a small, in, if I had not connected with them in a small group, it would not have happened. And so I am so grateful for them. And that's what community can do. It can do it in my life, and it can do it in your lives. So I deeply, deeply encourage you, if you don't have a small group, find one. We have, um, they're launching September 10th, so we have three weeks of signups, and then they'll start the week of September 10th. And we have all kinds of opportunities out there today for you to sign up. You can sign up out in the hallway. I'm also going to be sending an email later with a link. You can sign up at foschurch.com. There's lots of ways for you to find a group and get connected. But I'm telling you, you will not um, really grasp what God can do in your life until you do it with a community of people and you can share in life together and do life together. So I encourage you to do that. One of the groups that I'm really excited about starting. We have several new ones. We have a marriage group that's starting. We have a men's group um, called Wild at Heart, um, that that's going to be a great group. Super excited about that. The other one that I'm really, really excited about is called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. This is a group. There are five leaders to this group because it's kind of like a little bit different, but it's going to be, it's more of a discipleship initiative to get you guys going and get you stronger and deeper in your relationship with the Lord. So we'll have a larger group and then we'll break up into more smaller gender specific groups while you're there and you'll connect with those people in that group. This group is going to help you figure out, it's called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. It's going to help you kind of figure out who you are so that you can better serve God and you can grow in your relationship with him. And it's going to teach you some ways and some disciplines and some things how to do that. It's going to give you a great resource to take your spiritual level to the, or your spiritual walk. I did that last service too. Spiritual walk to the next level. So I, I really, really encourage you to, to seek that group out to find me. I'll be out here and we can talk about it. And um, all of them, there's just lots of opportunities. There's so many, there's one for every one of you and you'll be able to find one that fits you. And we've got some small group leaders out there that are willing to help you. I'll be out there and we're going to find the group that Taylor fits you so that you can take the next level in your walk. Um, I can't wait to meet you. Come see me. So good. Thank you, Meredith. Yep. So this is a gift we want to give you that you actually give to yourself by, by taking advantage of it. Um, and I got to tell you, as, as pastor, this is what I've seen. Those who are connected well in a small group, we really can take good care of you when the storm hits. And those who aren't involved in a small group, we really struggle to take care of you like we want to. Now, the reality is you'll still be taken care of better than, than if you were out on your own totally and you weren't part of a body. 
of Christ like this. But when you're in a small group, we really can bring the best game. We can help you the most. So I'm asking you in advance to dig the well before you're thirsty, plant the tree before you need it, get ahead of this before the storm hits, and go ahead and, and build some resources and some reserves into your life and get involved in not just in rows, but let's get into circles too, okay? Hope you'll do that. I'm just begging you to because we want you to be healthy. We want you to be whole, and we want to be able to take care of you when life hits because life is coming. We can't do it if you don't help us, okay? Make sense? So hook on, latch on, get out there and figure out a group you can be a part of because there's a lot of them, and um, it's a really beautiful lineup when you see on the table all the different groups. I promise you there's something for you. It's so good. All right, so, um, you know, we're in this heaven series, and, and sometimes you see things in the heavens and the physical earth that reminds you of a heaven that's coming. This past Monday, I had the chance to, to be near, near the epicenter of the eclipse, the great North American solar eclipse with the cool glasses and all the stuff. Uh, how many of you guys, did anybody else travel down that, to that region? You were close. Bowling Green, yeah, you were right there. Bowling Green was pretty good. Some of the rest of you got down in that region. Now, I, my understanding was back, at, back up here, it wasn't so much. It's like, yeah, it's okay. Not so much. But when you went down to Hopkinsville, when you show up at Gene and Sandy Doyon's place, Father, Brother Tom's dad, who's the coolest Doyon, by the way. I mean, you're like sub-cool, like compared to your dad. I mean I, I mean, I like you a lot, but like Gene's the bomb. And Sandy, she's the bombette. And so... The bomb and the bomb at, and they, and they were gracious enough to let some of us come and crash in their yard and, and camp out the night before. So Julie and I uh, took, took the boys down. We traveled to Hopkinsville last Sunday afternoon, and uh, we, uh, Julie and I car camped. We took the back seats out of our van and put a queen-size air mattress back there, and if it got too hot at night, we went and turned the van on for a while and cooled it down and went right back to sleep. So kind of a wimpy camper, I guess, and, uh, and then hung out at their place and and they were gracious enough to just let us crash that. And they got a nice pool out back. And, and so I've got a really great video I'll post up later on my Facebook of, of that two and a half minutes or so of the total solar eclipse. It was amazing. It was kind of like a 360-degree sunset. It was not totally pitch dark, but it was pretty dark. And it reminded us that there's a God that's in control of the universe that's just way bigger than us. And it was amazing. But, um, you know, one of the coolest things for me, and it wasn't, the, it wasn't just the solar eclipse, it was... It was getting to hang out with Gene Doyon. He's a cool cat. And he and Sandy have a camper down in Key West, Florida, down along the Florida Keys. And they go and spend several months every year down in the Florida Keys. Now, that's pretty near to heaven right there, right? Does a little fishing down there. He's in this fishing village where they've got great community. And, um, and they set up shop there each winter and uh, over winter down there. And it's just really cool. So I wanted to show you kind of a picture of uh, of. Gene's camping spot down there in Key West, near to heaven. So here it is. So you can kind of see this uh, RV park. This is not your average RV park. This is upscale. This is like big time. And so when Gene's headed down, he just calls down and says, hey, go put my camper on my parking spot. He gets there. It's all set up for him. They roll into town, and <clears throat> they've got a home away from home, and they're camping out there. Sounds good, doesn't it? How many of you guys like to do that? Yeah, like he built my dream. I'm like, dude, someday, maybe, I'll figure this out. Although Julie's idea of camping is like a holiday in is as low as she, she ain't doing nothing beyond that. So I, I don't know if I ever get her into a camper or not. But, but anyway, uh, Gene and Sandy have a, have a spot somewhere, I think over in the green spaces. Tom, is that about right there? In the green spaces over here on the right, over toward the water a little bit. But if you'll notice, if you go up, follow up toward the top of the, of the picture, you'll see a bridge coming from your right over to your left. And it says that Key West is to your left, 33 miles, and Miami's 126 miles to your right on the Overseas Highway. And between the Overseas Highway and the campground, there's a row of water where they have all the, they park the boats. Now, Gene parks his boat out there in one of those slips right now. But if you're really high cotton, if you're really the bomb diggity in this camping spot, then you want to move over so that your campsite is right next to your boat, right? You want to get to the primo spot. The primo spot is up here at the top. They're in the orange there, those 1 through 19 spaces right there, or maybe even 1 through 6. You want to get into one of those spots because when you're in one of those spots, you're getting real close to heaven. Your boat's right there. You can watch your boat. You can just move stuff in and out of your campsite real easy. It's exactly what you want to be. 
But that is called, that row up there, it's called death row. So Gene is trying to get on death row right now. Can you imagine trying to get on death row? Um, because he, <laughs> the way, you know why they call it death row? Because the only way people's coming out of one of those spots <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, I mean, <laughs> you've got to get, if something's got to go wrong and you're not coming back to your camp spot, so you finally give it up. Now, Gene did assure me that not everybody dies. Some of them just get really sick. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, okay, <laughs> whatever. But you get, you're getting nearer to heaven as you get over there on death row. But uh, so, Gene, if you watch this, man, we're praying for you to get on death row. Um, we want you to get there, uh, but hold that spot for a long time, friend. And uh, thanks for the eclipse. It was great. So anyway, uh, fantastic couple. And, and Tom's dad's trying to get on death row. To stop. You'd want to know that. And uh, if I was down there, I'd probably want to get on death row too because you get real close to heaven when you're on death row. And I guess if you, if you know your destination, right, if you know that you're promised heaven and all of the good things that come with heaven, death row wouldn't be such a bad place to be there near to the end of of this time, stepping into the next. And the reality is we all kind of live on death row, don't we? We're all kind of there. If you think about life, and I don't want to be morbid, but the reality is none of us are guaranteed anything. I don't know who makes it back next week. I hope we all do, but I really don't know. I've seen enough and been here long enough to know that sometimes it just doesn't happen that way. And it could be me, it could be you. And so, so we always want to live like we're on death row, like we're right up at the edge of eternity. And I think if we could live that way with eternity in view, that it would temper what we do. It would change how we live life. It would change the commitments we make, we make and, and how we love people. And we would let little offenses go a little bit easier, wouldn't we? If we knew, you know what? It just doesn't matter that much. Some of the things we're so wrapped up in and we're so worried about just really don't matter in light of eternity, do they? And so we want to get our view, get our vision up of what's next as we all live on death row. We, we all are at the edge of eternity. And so I wanted to dive in today to seven heavenly promises that you can take to the bank. As we wrap up this series, I wanted to give you seven things to think about, seven promises that you can take to the bank. This would be a good sermon to make just a few bullet notes on and then tuck them away in your Bible for when you're having a hard week, you're facing a tough challenge. When you're not sure how life is going to go, you can be reminded that this is not all there is. This isn't the end of it all. This is just the beginning as we head into an eternity with God. And I want to remind you of a fantastic promise from 1 Corinthians 2.9 as I start into this. This is what the scriptures mean. It says this, that no eye, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. You can't even begin to imagine what's coming. You can't even begin to imagine. Isn't that good news? But inside of that, I want to give you seven hooks, seven ideas, seven things that we can at least begin to, to hone our imaginations toward and train our sights toward that we can hang on to as we head toward heaven. Okay, first of all, from Isaiah 25 and 8, the first promise that I want you to hang on to is that there are going to be no more tears in heaven. No more tears. Whatever's making you cry here, whatever's squeezing your heart, whatever's causing you pain today, it's going to be gone there. There'll be no more tears. Isn't that good news? No more tears, no more suffering, no more pain. And it says this, that, that he will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. He'll remove forever all insults and mockery against his land and his people. There won't be anything there that will cause us pain. There'll be no more tears. Man, that's, all, that's almost hard to imagine, isn't it? Just a place with no more tears, where you're not going to have to say goodbye anymore, where the things that cause us pain here, the separation that we experience here when we say goodbye to someone we've loved. Uh, it may not be like we're leaving like for death, but it may just be separation because we're traveling. Or like, like my friends, missionaries, the Parks, who are in the back today, so glad you all are here. John and Tanya are here with us today, and they serve, serve over in Slovak. It's a fantastic couple. I want you to meet them. You got to stand up for just a second. And uh, you want you guys to turn around, see them. Make sure you meet them after worship today. They're, they're, uh, they're on sabbatical right now for a little bit, but they're doing good work. Um, and so I want you to know more about them. But uh, and not too long from now, they'll say goodbye to, to Tanya's mom and dad, and they'll head back overseas. And that's a hard time, isn't it? That's a hard time. Connie and John would certainly testify. It's hard to let your children serve overseas. 
to go a long way away because we experience separation. It brings us pain. It hurts our hearts to let go of ones we love. There'll come a place in heaven where there's no more goodbyes. There's no more dropping your kids off at college. How many of you guys have done that in the past week or two? Raise your hands up high. I'm praying for you, man. I don't know of anything much worse than that. I mean, I, there are other things worse than that because at least they're, at least they get to go to college and at least they're, they're well and healthy and they're, they, they can do that. I get that. But still, it's hard. That driving away from that campus, man, it's tough. Tough. Done that several times. And I just don't like separation. We're coming to a place where there's not going to be any more of those tears, no more of those separations. And that'll be really good. The second one I want you to hang on to is this. There'll be no more suffering and no more death. Death will be finally defeated. It will be wiped away. It will be taken away. Revelation 22, 1 through 5 says this. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything, for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and His servants will worship Him. And they will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads, and there will be no more night there, no need for lamps or sun. For the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. Let me ask you a question. Why does the tree of life bear 12 crops a year? Not a trick question. Think about what its purpose is. Healing. So what does it mean that it's bearing new fruit all the time? What's happening? Total restoration, total healing, eternal flowing, healing from the crystal springs, from the tree of life, perfect place where everything is made right, everything is replenished. God is a generous God. Heaven is not a static place. It's not just a a mechanical place. It's not just a place with golden streets, whatever that is. Um, It is a flowing beautiful, organic place that's made to be the ultimate of anything you've ever imagined made perfect with all this healing coming forward all the time. Isn't that good news? That there's 12 crops all the time. It's, there's enough for all of us for all of time because of the gracious God that we serve and who's going to be in the midst of heaven making everything right. It will be everything you imagine Eden to be times a zillion Everything we thought was happening in Eden when, when things were first created and things were exactly right will be restored times a zillion with this tree of life right in the middle, giving us all that we need for a perpetual life. So many things that you're searching for right now, special creams and potions and lotions and pills and, and diets to make you perpetually well, to get over your sickness so you don't have to have this organ recital all the time of all the things that are happening to you. Um, you can finally have a place where you don't have to deal with any of that anymore. You'll be perpetually well, wouldn't that be good news? That all that all that stuff that go that's bugging you right now, your high cholesterol, your blood pressure, your your kidney, your spleen, your liver, your appendix, whatever it is, it's all gonna be working just fine. It's all gonna be perfect because we're gonna be in a really good space. Your A one C will even get in line. It'll be perfect. Okay, so it's all gonna be good. And uh so we got this crop of these fresh fruits coming forward to, to heal us and to make us well. That's something you can take to the bank. That's a promise you can take to the bank, that those who follow Christ have this great promise that um, is going to be there. Um, the next promise is this, that there's going to be the feasting is going to be there. And I don't know about you, but I like a good feast. I like, a, I like a good roast beast and a feast, and I like to have it with friends and family and people that I love, and I love to have plenty of time at the table with them. And what I like most of all is when I don't have to wash the dishes. Okay? How many of you guys like good feasts like that? You like to be at a table with people you love. And, and you know, so there's something about having, having a good meal with people that you love. And Jesus describes what's going to happen in heaven as a great wedding banquet. And what we have to understand is that wedding banquets in the time of Christ were elaborate festivals. They were these things where there was elaborate food and lots of food, and it stretched for days, not just for an hour or two. Our best Wedding receptions pale in comparison to what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about a wedding feast. The very best wedding reception you've ever been to 
is just a shadow of what Jesus is talking about when he talks about a wedding feast. He's talking about something that goes on for a long time where food is in abundance, where fellowship is, is abundant, where there's time, and everyone's carved out space and time just to be in that zone and to be together. Won't that be cool? We can just be with some other people that you really enjoy being with. You know, um, we've got this game at my house that I, that I bought because I really like it, and we played it a time or two. It's called Catan. Anybody else Catan fans? I've got, I've got a few. Okay, hold your, hands out, hold your hands high. Somebody knows how to play it and needs to teach me how to play it. Because number one, we don't play it right at my house. Number two, I'm the only one in my family that likes it. Okay? Um, but in heaven, I'm going to get to play Catan with people that like it. And I think I'm going to invite my family to be there. And we're going to play for like 3,000 years. Because, hey, it's eternity. I mean, how long is 3,000 years in heaven? I mean, it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, it's like we're playing for 3,000 years. As long as I win, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if, I, if I wind up at the end of it as a winner, it's all good. Um, so this game is kind of, I think it's just a cool game. It's way better than Monopoly um, or any one of those things. This is more, uh, it's just cooler. It's just cooler. I promise. Uh, it, it's, it's fun. And so in this, in my imagination of heaven, it's going to be plenty of time to do those things you love the most with the people you love the most uh, with plenty of of food and time and and uh, whatever it is you like to drink. I could drink unlimited Coca-Cola and not get fat in heaven, okay? Can't do it here. You have to stay away from it here. But in heaven, maybe that's what it'll be. I don't know what your drink of choice would be, but whatever it is, it will be a, uh, a good thing to be there at this festival in this place. Jesus lines it out this way. He tells a parable about a great feast. And he gives you a glimpse into what heaven is going to be like. He does this in Matthew 22. This is, how he, this is how he frames it up, beginning at verse 2. The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. So it's a king preparing a feast for his son. So king has lots of resources. This is his son. It's going to be a lavish banquet. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify those who were invited. But they all refused to come. So he sent other servants to tell them the feast has been prepared. The bulls and fattened cattle have been killed. And everything is ready. Come to the banquet But the guests he had invited ignored them and went their own way, one to his farm, another to his business. Others seized his messengers and insulted them and killed them. The king was furious, and he sent out his army to destroy the murderers and burn their town. And he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, and the guests I invited aren't worthy of the honor. Now go out to the street corners and invite everyone you see. So the servants brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike, And the banquet hall was filled with guests. Now I'm grateful for that last phrase. They brought in the good and bad alike. That covers me on the bad side and you on the good side. So we both got invited. It's a good thing, right? The question would be, have you accepted the invitation? You've been invited to this great festival, this great eternal banquet with the king of the universe throwing a party for his son as the bride of Christ, the church is reunited with Jesus at the ultimate consummation of creation, and this festival starts, and you've been invited to be there. Wouldn't you like to be there? And let me go a step further. In, in the times of Christ, there's important. The author puts something here we take for granted. You're used to eating beef. As a matter of fact, one of the challenges we have as Americans, we probably eat too much beef. But the rest of the world isn't like that, and it especially wasn't like that 2,000 years ago when Christ told the story. You see, they killed a fattened calf, a cow and a calf, I think, in this case. So there's lots of beef at this party. Beef was rare. I don't mean like cooked rare. I mean like it just didn't exist. There wasn't much of it. And so so this king has thrown out the very best he has. And by the way, beef is still rare around the world. Did you know that? I have some friends who went to Cuba on a mission trip over the summer. I talked with one of them yesterday. He said, I said, well, what did you learn there? What did you see? He said, well, in Cuba, they eat lots of pork. I said, well, why why is that? He said, well, I said, are there no cows? He said, oh, yeah, there's cows, but the government owns them all. You're not allowed to have a cow there. If a cow dies in your field, you're not allowed to butcher it and get the meat. You know what they do there? The government officials come and watch you burn it. Be grateful you live where you do. It's still different around the world. So every time you think America's horrible, bad, awful, ugly place, get a grip. Celebrate what you got because it's different. And if you can kill a fatty calf or go to McDonald's today and get you some beef, you're living in some high cotton, friends. 
because it's not that way around the world. And it certainly wasn't that way when Jesus is framing up this Feastable where there's fatted cows that have been killed for steaks on the grill, baby. It is so good, and you've been invited. The question is, have you accepted the invitation? Will you accept the invitation? And I'm asking you today to just honestly assess your own heart. Have you accepted the invitation of Jesus to be a part of this eternal festival? If you haven't, I would encourage you today to make a commitment, a decision that you'll allow Jesus to be your path into this festival. I'd love to talk to you about that afterwards if you want to, or you can complete one of the Connect cards and let us know that you'd like to grab a coffee, and we'll help you figure this out. So accept that invitation. Don't be like one of those who doesn't. And and it's interesting that the king isn't happy that the the, the banquet hall is not full. So what does he do? He keeps sending out servants to do what? To invite more people. Why does this matter to the king? Why does it matter? Because he wants you there. So consider me the messenger today to tell you this great God, Father of the universe, creator of everything, is throwing a wedding banquet sometime from now, and you are invited and encouraged to come. You're invited. So accept the invitation. So this is, this is part of the promise of heaven. So feasting is going to be there. And then the next one, I like this one a lot um, because I like to be involved in productive things. And, and I believe that we all have a purpose and a design. And if you live on purpose by design, when you find your place living on purpose by design, that you will be very on fire for the life that you have. If you're bored, frustrated, upset about the life you're living, the job you have, the things you're doing, it's because you're not living on purpose by design. You're doing something that doesn't match your design. But if you could do what you were designed to do, in a way that brings fulfillment to you and, and it brings good things to, to life for the world, wasn't, wouldn't that be fantastic? Some of you have jobs and careers that you love, and it's a glimpse of what heaven will be like when you're doing something you were born to do. When you're in your space doing your thing, it makes all the difference. My friend Rob Till, Tillman is here. This man can make a serious table. Dude, this man's an artist. It's, this, I wish you could see his work. But when you're in your shop working on those kinds of things, is that just a little taste of heaven? Just to be in the middle of your space doing what you're born to do? It's therapy. Yeah, when we're doing what we were designed to do, it's almost like time stands still. When you work in your space doing what you were destined and wired to do, it's therapy. It's wonderful. When we're separated from what we're designed to do, it feels a little bit like hell. That's why it's so tough on us to be disconnected from work, from things. So although heaven isn't going to be a place where, you, where, where workaholism, workaholism is going to be rewarded, it will be a place where you will have meaningful things to do. Do you know that when Adam and Eve were created, they were designed to be co-regent with God in the Garden of Eden, that they were to be the king and the queen of planet Earth as it was at that moment? Did you know that? And when we fell, we fell from being kings and queens. We took a lesser place. And a lesser place is part of the the angst and the anxiety we feel in life when we're not really on purpose, not living by our design when we're separated from that. To be put back together with our design when we live on purpose by design, it's a breath of fresh air. So good news is in heaven, it's all going to be restored. That You're going to reign alongside Christ in heaven in a perfect situation where the government's going to be exactly the way it's supposed to be, where God will be in charge, everything will be made right, there'll be no more petty politics, it will just be a well-oiled machine where the orchestration of of the needs being met of people will be perfectly done. And it will be done through you as co-regent with God. So here's the the next promise. You'll reign alongside Christ in a new heavens and a new earth, that you're going to be right there beside him with with God sovereignly ruling over this perfectly ran place where there's zero corruption and zero political battles. It will be a perfect place where you're restored to a place of honor and respect and dignity doing something that you were wired to do. So if you have a craft or a purpose here on earth, something you really love to do, good chances are you're going to get to do more of it in heaven in a more powerful way. Now, for me, that sounds a lot more appealing than hanging out on a cloud playing a harp. Number one, I don't know how to play a harp. Number two, I don't like clouds. And number three, I don't like being separated from people that far on my own little cloud. Okay, I mean, I can be on a little cloud for a little while, but not forever. I don't know about you. Some of you might like a solitary cloud with a harp. (laughs) Good for you. If that's what you like, maybe God will let you do that. But I don't think so. I think 
you're going to get to be in connection with people in a perfect place and get to use your very best strengths, abilities, and talents. Isn't that good news? And I don't know really all that that means, but I just this is in there enough that, that uh, it's going to be really pretty cool as Christ brings things forward, as the new heavens and earth are established, and we take our place as the rightful sons and daughters of the Most High God. And to be a rightful son and daughter of a king is to become a prince or a princess and eventually a king or a queen, right? So co-regent, to be in our proper place. That's another promise you can take to the bank. As you look toward heaven, you're going to have something meaningful to do, something purposeful to do that will really energize you. It'll be exactly the perfect fit. You'll be living on purpose by design for eternity. All right, and then the next one. The next promise of heaven is you're going to be known. You're going to be known. You're going to be in connection with people. In the book of Genesis and creation, Genesis 2.18, God has seen that man is alone and it's not good. So he creates Eve to be with him. He creates fellowship. He creates union. The idea of being known is an intimate relationship with somebody else. Well, in heaven, you're going to be known fully and, and, and you'll know others fully. It will be an ultimate connection. It will be the kinds of connection you long for with people. You won't be some anonymous entity. You won't just be a little speck of light hanging out on a cloud playing a harp. You will actually be connected to people in a way that's meaningful and purposeful. The best fellowship you've ever had here, the best, the best friends you've ever had here multiplied times a zillion. Wouldn't that be cool? And, and multiple of those relationships, just totally a bucket full of the best relationships you can imagine being known and being fully known and knowing others fully. Uh, so it's, it's that connection you've experienced here, glimpses of only a zillion times better. Amp it by a zillion, and we're getting close to what heaven is going to be like. So your relationships, the little ones you've tasted here that have been pretty good, going to be perfect, perfect and perfected there. So uh, that's pretty good. And Randy Alcorn, who wrote the book uh, on heaven that I've referenced several times, he calls this the continuity principle. This is one that's important for you to kind of make note of and to think about. If you've seen something in in the Bible that reflects what heaven might be like or what earth is like, or if you've had a, had a sunrise moment where you happen to be up when the sun comes up and it's one of those beautiful mornings when everything's exactly right and the sun peeks up over the horizon and all you can do is go, oh, God, that's amazing. When you see that, and it's just a little taste, then what you need to know is that that sort of experience will continue right on into eternity, only times a zillion, only times made exactly right. So it would be the continuity plus principle. Add a little bit to it, multiply it, amp it, and know that the great things that you see in the Bible and that you experience on earth, those tastes of heaven will be amped and multiplied. It's continuity plus. You're getting a glimpse of what's to come. You're foreshadowing of what's coming forward. This is good news, right? How many of you guys are looking forward to this? You're, you kind of you wouldn't mind moving your boat slip over to death row, get over a little bit closer. Like it's okay if I live off on death row because man, what's coming next is way better. It's way more better than where it is right here. So you're going to be fully known. Um, and then the next one, that that God through Jesus sends a message: I'm preparing a place for you. God, who's been working on this creation on on Earth. For all this time has been preparing a place for you and for me to come be with him, a perfect place. Won't that be amazing to be in a perfect place? And Jesus says it this way in John 14. In my father's house are many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you. But I'm, come, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and I'm going to take you with me so that you can be where I am. This is a great promise. Jesus doesn't just leave it to you to figure out how to get there. He says he's coming back to take you there. Now, for me, as one who gets lost really easily, that's really good news. Just come pick me up because I may not make it there. If I'm my own, I know you gave me GPS, and I know I'm supposed to be able to get there, but I can't. So just come get me. And Jesus says, I'm coming to get you. And I'm going to take you to be where I am. I'm going to bring you to this perfect place that I've been working on, this place that I've been creating the ultimate creator, designer, God of the universe, making a place for you, a perfect place, a perfect place. One, you know, we try to create our own spaces and paint our houses, do our things, and dress them up and doll them up or buy the most expensive place we can and all that. And those are little glimpses of heaven. But man, nothing compared to what God is preparing for you and for me right now. 
So whatever you've imagined, however good it is, multiply times a zillion, and we're getting close. We're getting close. So God is making a place for you. And then here's the seventh promise you can take to the bank. And by the way, there's, I could have done this. This sermon could last for days because there's a, a, that many promises, but I limited it to seven. Here's the seventh one, that this body that sometimes decays and rots and you got to take a lot of pills and medicine or surgeries uh, uh, or it just begins to wilt, begin to lose some of your sharpness, muscles begin to fade, whatever. You have your organ recital of all the things that are failing, all that stuff. That won't happen anymore. There'll come a time after after we hit heaven, we hit a space where we're, where our bodies will be separated from our spirits, but there'll come a time when our bodies come back to our spirits when Christ returns and makes all things right. And we're given a resurrection body, the kind that Jesus was given, the first fruits of the new resurrection. Some theologians call it a transphysical body, a body that transcends our physical limits that we have right now. And I don't know about you, when I was a child, we lived upstairs in my grandparents' house for just a while. And while we lived upstairs, there was something about the stairs. I don't know why I dreamed of this, but I used to dream I could fly. Any of you guys ever have that dream that you could fly? I mean, it was such a cool dream. That was a dream I never wanted to wake up from. That was so much fun. The things you could do when you could fly. And it, it might be a glimpse of what's to come. It might be a glimpse of what's to come. Benjamin Calamy says it this way about our earthly bodies. He says, the earthly body is slow and it's heavy in all of its motions. It's listless and soon tired with action. But our heavenly bodies, he says this, so the heavenly bodies will be, as, will be like they're on fire. They'll dance and, and, and our bodies will be as nimble as our thoughts are, that your body will be able to just to flow and move and, and to do things we can't even imagine right now. You'll be your ultimate stunt double. Everything you've ever wanted to do, but we're afraid to try because you might die or get hurt, you'll be able to do it. Wouldn't that be cool? I mean, you, you'll be like the ultimate parkour person. You'll just be jumping off stuff and running house to house. You'll be like Spider-Man and Superman and, and Iron Man all rolled into one. It'll be this incredible, amazing thing that you're able to do. Um, or Wonder Woman too. I don't really throw out. Okay. Um, however you do that. Um, but whatever it is, whatever superhero you imagine, all the powers they have, you get those times a zillion. In this transphysical body, when everything's made right, um, everything will work perfectly, and our abilities will be beyond anything you've ever imagined. Anything you've ever seen, thought, heard about what your body could do, becomes true, becomes real, and you can take that promise to the bank that God has provided all these things in heaven because of the work of Jesus. That everything you, we've talked about, only better, is going to be there. This perfected body will be a gift for you in heaven with God. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. You can't even begin to imagine Gene Doyon and Sandy are probably going to get their place up there on death row. They're probably going to have a pretty cool ride the next few years down there in Key West. It's going to feel a little bit like heaven. The fish is probably going to be pretty good and the fellowship's going to be great. But there'll be reminders that this is just the Shadowlands, that this isn't all there is. As great as that is, it's still just the Shadowlands. There's more that there's a heaven past this one where things are a zillion times better, where things are all right. And those seven promises we talked about today, they all come true times a zillion. You can take that to the bank.